Good morning. It's Monday, April 30th, and you're watching LPAC TV. We've entered into a time in history in which anything less than a revolutionary state of mind will inherently lead to disaster. It's only by calling all previous habits, presumptions, modes of behavior, and prevailing opinion into question and being willing to usher in sudden, radical, and unprecedented changes in policy that mankind will even possibly have a chance at surviving the current calamity. At the point of a breakdown crisis, when all previous policymaking has failed and all attempts to extrapolate past experience only makes matters worse, it will be those few individuals who are willing to critically examine the very foundations which underlie the global trends in statecraft and policymaking and overturn those that have caused the threatened disintegration of human civilization itself, who will emerge as the leadership of and among the world's nations and will be able to affect the profound and systemic shifts in not only policy, but also mankind's vision and view of itself. Over the weekend, Lyndon LaRouche completed and published two new written reports, Dreams of a Modern Nero and Time for Glass-Steagall in Britain. As Mr. LaRouche states in the introduction to the latter report, any rescue from this present world crisis requires the kinds of immediate systemic corrections which could only be expressed now in the form of a profoundly radical shift in global trends in statecraft. Suitable changes, if they occur, will be experienced as the immediate and radical overturns of certain hitherto prevalent presumptions, presumptions respecting both the evolutionary and even revolutionary development, respecting expressions of most among the ancient through contemporary policies of nations. Last Friday, April 27th, Helga Tsepp LaRouche delivered a profoundly historic webcast address to an audience gathered predominantly in Spain and Portugal. The invitation to the webcast posed precisely the question which is now testing the fitness of the nations of the transatlantic to survive. It read, Must Spain and Portugal follow Greece into self-destruction? Is Europe condemned to die under policies that have failed? Must nations continue to stand helpless, or worse, while the bankrupt City of London and Wall Street drive the world towards global nuclear war? Cannot we change the course of history away from the brink of catastrophe before it is too late? Are we not human? Helga LaRouche began her opening remarks by identifying the two existential threats now facing humanity. One, the volcano of thermonuclear war, which could erupt any day or any hour. And two, the equally existential disintegration of the current global financial system. However, she emphatically stated that there is an alternative. I think it is important to face these dangers, but let me say in the beginning that the purpose of this webcast is not to just look at the horrible condition in which the world finds itself, but the purpose of this webcast is to address ourselves, especially to the people in Spain and Portugal who are hit right now with the consequences of a completely incompetent and I would even say malicious policy on the side of the European Union and to start to discuss the fact that Mrs. Merkel is not right when she says there is no alternative. This is the most favorite sentence of Mrs. Merkel. She always says there is no alternative to the euro, there is no alternative to the fiscal austerity, to the debt break, uh, to the bailouts. Now, that is all not true. There is an alternative, and that alternative has been tested in history. It is called Class Diegel. That was the banking separation which was introduced by Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1933 and which led America out of the Depression uh, in the 30s. Now, that can be applied today. There are also other forms of 
uh, financial systems. You don't have to stick with a bankrupt monetary system. There is the possibility to go to a credit system. And there is a quite elaborated plan for the economic reconstruction of the United States, of Europe, and even the world economy. And I want to solicit from this program people from Spain, Portugal, but also other countries to help to put together a reconstruction program, which we have already basically ready in outlines, but I want to have the collaboration of engineers, scientists, students, trade unions, and other people to help to put it on the, on the table uh, quickly. We encourage you to watch this webcast in full, including the discussion period, during which Mrs. LaRouche answered questions from Spain, from Ireland, even from Brazil. What we're seeing now is an increasingly awakened European population mobilizing itself to take history into its own hands and make the decisions which will determine their own destiny and the destiny of the world, catalyzed largely by the leadership which Mrs. LaRouche, Jacques Cheminade, their co-thinkers, and the LaRouche movement generally has provided. Just look at the official declaration issued by 14 very prominent German and French economists that was published in leading French and German papers this weekend, including the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. This appeal to the governments of the European Union, as the declaration is called, calls officially for an end to the Euro experiment. Starting off with a quote from the poet Heinrich Heine, which very appropriately reads, you should have the courage to tell your people when the hour has arrived. They declare, 13 years since the introduction of the euro, it is obvious that the euro currency experiment not only has not fulfilled its promises, but that its continuation will even lead into chaos. After enumerating the brutal effects the euro has caused, comparing the current crisis to that of the pre-fascist 1930s and declaring that any attempts to bail out the current system will be in vain, the economists warn, if this Euro rescue policy is not immediately stopped, the adventure of the common currency will end tragically. The economic situation will become worse, unemployment will get out of hand, social unrest increasing extremist tendencies, re-emergence of old conflicts, dissolution of democracy and rule of law. All these negative factors will lead to ungovernability in Europe and massively hurt Europe's relevance in the world. The European Union can no longer be a ball game of a global financial oligarchy, which aims to destroy the foundations of our life. Is it not shameful to witness how they subjugate politics and the economy according to their interests, pushing these to the forefront? The Declaration ends with the following appeal. Therefore, we call on our governments to propose to other member countries to put an end to the Euro experiment and to take the following measures to replace the euro with national currencies, with each state retaining all its prerogatives, while certain countries may reach bilateral or multilateral agreements to pool their currency, to create a new European monetary system, having a European unit of account equal to the weighted average of the national currency units, to list up front the desired parities of the national currencies to that unit of account, parities calculated so as to limit speculation, restore the competitiveness of all member states, ensure balanced trade among them, and reduce unemployment. To ensure that the actual exchange rates of the national currencies will then be stabilized within a fluctuation band to be determined. To convert internal prices and wages in each country, as well as bank assets, on the basis of one euro for each national currency unit. To convert, by applying the same rule, the public debt of all the euro countries into their new national currency. To convert international private loans and debts into the European unit of account. 
We know, of course, that none of these measures will function without first eliminating the speculative parasites through a coordinated action to impose Glass-Steagall and initiating the construction of great projects by which the physical economic viability and national credit of the nations of Europe may be restored. However, it is precisely the spirit of revolutionary change, declaring the old system dead and rotten and abandoning it in the interest of an entirely new system founded on completely different assumptions that is urgently necessary now. The fighting spirit is also spreading elsewhere in Europe, as more Irish trade unions now are joining the call for a no vote in the upcoming referendum on the austerity treaty, with the Civil Public and Services Union, CPSU, voting unanimously at their annual delegate conference in Cork on Saturday, joining three other major national unions in their decision to oppose the treaty. And so, it's clear that the credibility of the dead system is rapidly waning, and anyone operating on the premise of that dead system is very soon about to be swept into the gutter of history. This coming weekend, we will see not only the second round of the French elections, which very well may cast Sarkozy from the throne of power, but also the Greek elections as well, where a full-out citizen's revolt continues against the foreign occupation of their nation. And it's not only an ironic coincidence that at the same exact time we see the mighty of Europe falling from Mount Olympus and their thrones being overturned, a new leadership is being consolidated in Russia and China, marked by the official inauguration of Vladimir Putin as the incoming president of Russia, which will occur this coming weekend as well. In the days leading up to this inauguration, we've seen high-level meetings between the Russian and Chinese leadership, with declarations from both that the level of relationship between the two nations has reached an historic high. The polarization is clear. The existing system is dead, and those that are attempting to hold on to that system are being dragged down into hell along with it. And the leadership of nations such as Russia and China, and even Argentina right here in the Western Hemisphere of the globe, that have the courage to defend the sovereignty of their nations and look truthfully for the alternative, are finding themselves in a position of strength, a strategic position of advantage. The empire's hand has been forced. As they've been dragged into the open, as we can see in the flurry of reports from the Club of Rome, the Royal Society, Paul Ehrlich, the World Wildlife Foundation, all of them this week nakedly demanding the outright murder of billions and billions of people. By far, if it succeeded, the worst crime against humanity ever committed in history. This is an enemy which must be destroyed. There can be no compromise. There can be no agreement. This is truly a time for a revolutionary shift in the paradigm of history. And the leadership exists. Just look at what the LaRouche National Candidate slate is accomplishing in the United States, despite the insanity of the two candidates for the presidency. If you haven't yet seen it, Diane Sayers' debate hosted by Bergen Grassroots in New Jersey is now available. Okay, so as people know, I'm Diane Sayer, and I'm running for Congress because the world and our nation are facing an existential crisis. We have a president who, according to the Israeli press and U.S. military sources, has encouraged Netanyahu to launch a strike on Iran, which could plunge us into thermonuclear war. Uh, we, the entire European banking system is admitted to need at least four trillion euros in bailouts, and therefore what urgently needs to be done, number one in the United States, is we have to reinstate FDR's Glass-Steagall Banking Act. We have to separate the commercial banks from the speculative banks and stop these bailouts. Number two, we have to restore the American system of national banking and credit as understood by Alexander Hamilton. That means no more Federal Reserve, and it means the ability to fund great projects such as the type that FDR built to get us out of the Depression 
specifically I'm proposing the North American Water and Power Alliance, which was a project from the 60s supported by both Kennedys, launched by Senator Frank Moss of Utah, which would bring water from Alaska, where there is a massive runoff into the Arctic Ocean, down into the Great Lakes region, all the way to Arizona, New Mexico. This project would employ about 4 million people, many of them for 30 years. And had this been built in the 60s when it was proposed, all of the flooding and droughts and devastation of the extreme weather of last year would not have had the impact that it had. So these are the three things that I believe urgently must be done. A return to Glass-Steagall banking, a return to the national system of national banking and credit, and the construction of NAWAPA. Thank you. Diane Sayer also hosted a highly successful town hall meeting attended by almost 50 activists and addressed by principal author of the Nawapa 21 report, Michael Kirsch, this weekend. The footage of this event will be available on this site later today as well. And this only typifies the leadership now being catalyzed by this unified national candidacy. An intense national mobilization is now in progress with LaRouche movement activists covering the entire country, including flying squads in the crucial Nawapa states, Alaska, Arizona, and Idaho, to mobilize a juggernaut of support behind the threefold resolution for Glass-Steagall, National Banking, and Nawapa. So, as we stated in the beginning, we are living during one of those rare moments in human history where we have the opportunity to effect a sudden and total revolutionary change. The very foundations of belief have now been called into question. And it is our duty and our responsibility to discover and impose those truthful principles of economy, of culture, and of statecraft, to overturn the failed habits and presumptions that led us to this dire hour, and change the way that man thinks of himself and the universe that he inhabits. Within only a very few short months from now, in May, in June, in July, we could find ourselves living in a completely different paradigm of history, with the solutions which this movement has worked for decades to define actually becoming the adopted policy of major nations. The smell of victory indeed is in the air. The missing ingredient might just be the will to seize it.